Pro-Life Talk. Real World Answers. This is Life Report. Welcome to Life Report. I am Josh Braun, your host. We're here with Executive Director Jonathan Keller and local resident political expert, as well as a very special guest, Assemblywoman Linda Halderman. Thank you for being with us today, Linda. Thank you. Um, we're going to be talking about a Senate bill today. Uh, in fact, this story starts really weird. Linda and I met on a plane a couple months ago when I was on my way back from a speaking trip and basically eavesdropped on me for a couple of hours. I, that's exactly what I was doing. I was <laughs> fascinated. You were talking to Fresno State students, and yeah. I just couldn't help listen. It was a great dialogue. So it's this really weird thing where after we finally finish this conversation, then Linda is across the aisle is like, hey, I'm Linda Halderman, and, you know, and there's this bill coming up that you might want to know about, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. But before we get to that, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your professional history, because that's all actually going to weigh pretty heavily, or th there's reason to be talking about what your experience is professionally. Uh, sure. I didn't set out in my life to be a politician. This is my <laughs> first term, and uh, what I thought I was going to be was a, a country doctor. And for five years in Selma, California, raising capital of the world, uh -huh. I, was, I was blessed enough to be that. I spent five years as a general surgeon. Mm -hmm. Uh, doing general surgery and trauma, emergencies, et cetera. But the focus of my practice was the care of women, the diagnosis and treatment of women with breast cancer. And that was my great love. And it was frustration through dealing with the state of California and its various programs hmm. uh, that led me into looking at policy hmm. and finally getting to the point where I said, you know, maybe politics maybe as an elected official, I can do even more to help our broken state. Hmm. That's really cool. Okay, SB 1501, the safe access to early term reproductive health. Help us, exp help us understand what this bill is for our listeners that have never even heard of this bill. Sure, SB 1501 was introduced by Senator Christine Kehoe. Mm -hmm. It was introduced as a measure to allow California to permit non-physicians to perform surgical abortions. Hmm. This concept, this is a very unusual way to go about uh, changing who does surgical procedures. Hmm. And the reason is they most likely wanted to avoid any of the battles with the, the nurses who are adamantly opposed to this and have already come out in opposition. Hmm. So what they did instead is they used a little known pilot project that the state of California has. It is a uh, workforce pilot project, and it was started, ironically enough, in 1973 mm. to, uh, increase right. advocate, to increase access to gerontology care. Mm. Okay. And wow. somehow it morphed about three or four years ago into allowing the experimentation of whether or not non-physicians should do surgical abortions. And at that time, they called it early pregnancy care. Mm. I understand now, uh, now their buzzwords are early reproductive care, um, but this, this, isn't, this is kind of doublespeak. What, what it's this rather is, Orwellian. Is, <laughs> I, I agree. Uh, the, the real issue here is the performance of surgical abortions by non-physicians. How did you find out about this bill? Accident. I was a, a staffer. I, I did health policy for Dr. and Senator Sam Onestead. Hmm. And I found a pilot project called uh, Access to Early Pregnancy Care. And I thought that's great because <laughs> we could get prenatal visits and vitamins and physician's exam. This was terrific. And then I found out that it was purely about training wow. non surgeons to do surgical abortions during the first trimester. Wow. And they put three sites in California in areas of predominantly minority women. There were three Planned Parenthood clinics around the state. And after what they self-report as an average of seven days of training, they allowed uh, non-physicians to do surgical abortions without physician oversight. Wow. Talk to me about that seven days. I'm not a surgeon. I'm mm -hmm. not a doctor, so I don't know how, you know, is that a really low, low number for training for a certain kind of a surgical procedure? 
it's an essentially unheard of number. Really? As a surgeon, mm-hmm. I was trained uh, four years of college, four years of medical school, five years of general surgery training, wow. during which I had absolutely no time in which I was completely independent and <laughs> not under supervision. And indeed, that's that's one of the reasons we have high quality medical care is because we understand that some things require more training than others. Wow. Um, I would I would posit that if in fact someone could learn a surgical procedure and be competent in seven days, they would never argue that they should be without supervision in the early months and years of their practice. Mm-hmm. That's simply not done for surgical procedures. And 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 you've confirmed, or and, and, and we've confirmed the same thing. Is when I first heard about this bill, I actually thought it's probably just chemical abortions. They're probably training like midwives to do the pre-interview for like giving RE46 pills out. But we've confirmed this is actually surgical abortions too that Correct. they're allowed to do. In the state of California, the law is very specific. It allows physician assistants, nurse practitioners and midwives, all of whom are not surgeons or OBGYNs, it allows them to do non-surgical abortions, and that means the dispensing and the administering of RU486 or mifepristone, which causes an abortion. It does not, however, and it specifically excludes the performance of surgical abortions. Right. Some of the proponents of this particular legislation have tried to make the case, well, it's not a surgical procedure, but I beg to differ. Mm. I have seen the equipment that's used. I understand the risk of perforation. Mm -hmm. And I also think people should take into account there is a very significant difference in the pregnant versus the non-pregnant uterus and the risk for very serious complications Mm. such as hemorrhage. And that is the reason that abortion carries a known complication rate for the woman, in addition to the 100% fatality rate for the child. You know, I was really shocked when I was reading the San Diego newspaper coverage of this story, how incredibly euphemistic they were being and saying that, you know, this bill, well, it's not really changing the law. We just want to clarify that this would be an additional abortion procedure that these, you know, as you mentioned, certified nurse midwives, physician's assistants uh, would be able to perform. Um, and, And I couldn't believe that they stooped so low as to say that it was only to clarify the requirements. Um, It's absolutely, in my view, it it sounds like it's really vastly expanding the, and I would say lowering the bar for the type of people that can do surgical procedures. The type of abortion that they're specifying and trying to portray as non-surgical is called suction-assisted vacuum aspiration abortion. It involves the introduction of a a surgical cannula to then remove the lining of the uterus along with the fetal parts. Mm. That is in fact a surgical procedure. It's Mm. associated with perforation and with hemorrhage and has a known complication rate among highly trained OBGYNs of three to six percent. Infections, sepsis, those are all known, uncommon, but Absolutely, there are complications. You can't pretend that something's non-surgical when it has a complication of hemorrhage and yeah. perforation. And explain more or further the three to six percent number you just quoted. What, what, what is it? The, the three to six percent. Well, I was curious when I was reading over the study data, which is still raw data. It has never been peer-reviewed, even though the study was just recently completed. It has never been published, and again. This data is still raw, so I went over the raw data. And what I was curious about was the self-reported complication rate of the practitioners in this study, the midwives and nurse practitioners. And so I went to uh, known sources that are, in fact, pro-choice and that consist of surgeons who perform this procedure, such as the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology Mm -hmm. and its equivalents in Britain and around the world. Mm -hmm. And I found that the known expected complication rate for all complications is three to six percent. For just non-physicians or for everybody? That is for surgeons. Okay, wow. And that's OBGYNs and some sometimes, and it's uncommon, but sometimes family family practice physicians with mm-hmm. surgical training will do this. Right. But by and large, these were OBGYNs. Mm-hmm. So this is the experts in the field. So to, just to clarify, obviously, if it's a group like ACOG um, mm-hmm. that is producing these statistics, 
they have a vested interest in, I'm not saying that they would purposely mislead, but they have a vested interest in highlighting these statistics that show a low complication rate. Would that be fair to say? I think they have a a vested interest in telling the truth, and they have put out with data supported by hundreds of thousands of cases examined that shows that three to six percent of all complications, uh, whether it's minor or major complications, three to six percent is the expected rate. So there's no reason, for example, to believe that those numbers are higher than the real world example. For example, the, these these numbers, the three to six percent statistic, is not being put out by a you know extreme right wing group that is trying to discredit the procedure. Th- these are hard facts, about as clear and cut and dry as we could get them. Well, yes, and if we're going to look for bias, I guess we could say we should have an independent group. But honestly, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology went over so many hundreds of thousands of cases, and it would be their professional credibility to give us accurate statistics. So I think those make the most sense. And I think that even for pro-life advocates like Josh and myself, I know other people in the field that we've talked to, we would... And entirely accept those numbers. I mean, right. as being totally accurate. So, so, so three and three to six percent was the baseline. Then you looked at the self-reported numbers within the California study, mm-hmm. and what did you find? I found that in the California study of non-physicians doing abortions, surgical abortions, they self-reported a rate of one point six percent. And what does that tell you <laughs> when you see that number? <laughs> Given the fact that there were other oh, over 7,000 abortions performed during the several years of this pilot project. It tells me that there may be a study problem Mm. in the reporting. That gave me pause because I wanted to understand where where did they get that number? And what I found out was instead of surveying regional hospitals after procedures to find out how many women, for example, came in with hemorrhage after the clinics were closed, that wasn't done. Most of the follow-up, in fact, early in the study, it was only 50% of the patients who were ever seen again. Uh, Later, they they proudly got to 72% follow-up, which is not acceptable in a research study. That's how they figured out how to report complication rates. It's, it is not done in surgical practice. It is, it is not considered standard of practice in research to self-report your own complications without backup. Right, and, and how often were there, what was, was, I mean, what, what, was there follow-up done with 100% of the patients later by at least the person who did the abortion? Was there a follow-up with everybody? No, there was not. Wow. What, how, 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 what percentage do you know that the was The highest there? they could demonstrate was 72%, wow. many of which cons, uh, constituted a phone call. It's, yeah. it's not scientific method. And my concern as someone who's been a human rights advocate, um, especially in light of what we know about the Tuskegee um, hmm. experiments. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah. Informed consent may or may not have been uh, obtained appropriately mm. Mm. from these women. They might not have known it was not a physician doing the abortion. Not necessarily that, but the laws in California, the medical practice is that the person who performs the procedure must be the one to offer the risks, the benefits, the alternatives mm. to the patient because they are the one who's in fact the expert in the procedure. Mm-hmm. But in this case, when I read some of the summary data, it appeared as though the program coordinator who is not a medical practitioner of any kind, may have been the one to give consent wow. in many of these cases. I also have not seen any consent forms that were written in Spanish. Mm-hmm. And I have not had any reports that the practitioners appropriately had the language skills to consent during a research study, subjects who spoke only Spanish. Wow. These are things that we must be especially careful about in research because we are, in fact, doing experiments on right. human beings. Wow. Okay, and, and I'm just going to make a quick note because we've got some hardcore philosophy nerds that listen to this show. We're not saying, like, that when we talk about complication rates of, of abortion, like, I don't think there would be a good argument for making abortion illegal, or it's not an argument for making abortion, that, that, that abortion is wrong just because some women are hurt doing it. We think abortion is wrong because it kills a human being. However, I think it's a really important argument when you're talking about whether or not non-physicians should be doing abortions, and that's what we're talking about here. Let me ask you something else about this 
study. Well, was there like an age limit? Did it have to be like adults that that you know were part of the experiment that were having uh, abortions done? No, there were teenagers included in the wow. study. So, so I just want to clarify. I'm, I'm, I just can't believe these numbers. Still, you had ACOG. They use over a hundred thousand people in their study, and yet they don't want to use a study like that to support the need for having non-doctors perform abortions. And in California, we use 7,000 people. It's, it's over 100,000 versus 7,000, you said? Well, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology puts as a priority patient safety. In their, and in their view, that is the woman, their patient's yeah. safety during procedures. And that's why they're so invested in making sure they know what their complication rates yeah. are, as with any surgical procedure. Hmm. But I can't make an argument that we're improving women's safety Mm. by increasing access to a surgical procedure in a way that lowers the standard of care, and that's exactly what this proposes. Right. Well, and it seems very surprising to me. I know when you were on uh, Ray Appleton's show locally in Fresno a few weeks ago, the, the topic came up of the issue of the recent law passed a few years ago in California regarding tanning salons <laughs> and the fact that in California, for those of you who don't live in California, we have uh, some very ambitious legislators who decided that to care for patient safety, which I think is at least a legitimate concern to to notify people, that we would not allow minors to go and receive uh, tanning services in a tanning salon. Right. Uh, because Under the, any circumstance, yeah. even with parental permission. Now, I didn't realize that. I didn't know it was at, without even parental permission. Parental wow. m- permission is already required, and this law changed it so that no parent can ever allow a child wow. to go to a tanning booth. So, and again, if we're talking about the issue of safety. You know, if there are studies out there that show that there's a potential complication rate of melanomas or other sorts of cancer, maybe it's a reasonable thing to at least have full informed consent and maybe even to have restrictions on minors using that. But it shocks me that I think when I was looking at the co-sponsors for this bill by Senator Kehoe, SB 1501, I I believe that the author of that tanning bed bill was actually listed as one of the primary co-sponsors of this bill. Um, I need to go back and check that, but it seems odd to me that they would have such a concern about skin cancer, but that they would be willing to lower the bar of patient safety, as you said, in this regard. It, It really bothers me that if the argument for legal and safe abortions is being made that now, without supervision, without knowing what the complication rate is, well, that's okay as long as we increase access Mm. to this procedure. I don't understand the logic of that argument, and I certainly think that women's health advocates like me um, ought to be pretty alarmed by this. So so connecting the dots here, if you're in California. (laughs) I just make sure that I understand this correctly. So correct me if I if I if I'm confused. You can't teenagers even with parental permission cannot go to a tanning salon or be in a tanning bed. But an underage girl, as young as 13 theoretically, could go to a rural abortion clinic and have an abortion done, possibly without informed consent, by a non-physician like a midwife without the parents even being notified about it. Is that correct? That is correct. Wow. In the state of California, we consider a child who is pregnant no longer a child, regardless of that child's age. Right. Mm. I, I have a disagreement about that as, mm. as a physician. I don't think the age of consent ought to be 12, regardless <laughs> of pregnancy status. I think yeah. that's inappropriate considering yeah. maturity. Yeah. Um, the ability to understand the risks and complications and to make an informed decision that's that's the ultimate, not being experimented on. Yeah. And that we must afford to California's patients, all of them, regardless of whether they're 12 or whether they're pregnant. Right. That's mm. just the right thing to do. Well, I really appreciate the phrase that you used earlier, that, you, that you're not just a women's rights advocate in this case. You're a human rights advocate. And I like the fact that you connected it with the Tuskegee experiments because... I mean, really, I don't see how anybody, e- even if you're pro-choice, and I know, Josh, we have lots of pro-choice friends that listen to the show, and they may, may disagree with us on certain issues, but I think we could all agree that this is an issue that, for the safety and health of you know all the women in our society, this is a, a very poor example of um, government interfering in uh, standards of care and really lowering standards of care to the detriment of all patients. 
I think there's a lack of understanding about how serious this is. And Tuskegee, for a lot of us in the medical profession, was a very horrifying eye opener. Mm -hmm. Just for a quick review, what happened was that human beings who were imprisoned for various minor and major crimes were infected with syphilis and allowed to go the course of the disease in order to be studied rather than given a single shot of penicillin, which would have been curative. Wow. And syphilis is, in fact, a lethal disease. That is a stain on medical research, and we must learn from the lessons of the past that are so egregious. Hmm. One of the hallmarks of, of, of this show, Linda, is that we try to analyze where pro-choice people are coming from, what are their arguments, and then responding to them. So what are the main arguments from the pro-choice side in favor of this bill, and how would you respond? I mean, obviously, I mean, I don't think most pro-choice people are stupid. Um, so it seems like this is an obvious thing that we should be against, but they're coming from somewhere. So what, where are people like Kehoe coming from, and how would you respond to kind of the major pro-arguments for this bill? What's been published in the written documentation that she has provided me about the bill itself is that she believes there is a need to increase access to what she calls early reproductive health and what we know as first-term abortion. And her issue is that we need more providers of this surgical procedure and that the way to appropriately solve a need for more providers is to lower the standard of care by allowing less fully trained non-physicians to perform it. But I, I do think that there's a real problem with that argument. When we look at problems of access, if in fact we believe that there are not enough abortions being performed in the state of California, and we break it down by subgroup, in fact minority women have higher rates of abortion. For African-American women, that rate approaches 40% of all pregnancies. Mm. So if we were going to do these experiments, why was it targeted in minority communities, predominantly Hispanic women? And if we were talking about there's not enough access to certain abortions in California, in fact, it is later term abortions that have much fewer rates. These studies, this, this bill does not allow second trimester or late abortions. It in fact only allows early pregnancy abortions. So that argument to me is just not logical, but that's I believe what she's well, it's not what I believe. It's what she's uh, writing that this is for. So it sounds like she's concerned about, and we did a little research on this, 1% of California women live in counties that don't have an abortion clinic within that particular county. And so it sounds like maybe they're worried, okay, these, these women in these counties they would have to drive farther than other women to get abortions. And so their solution to that... If, Pro, quote unquote problem. I don't think that's a problem, but the problem for them is to not, it's not training more physicians to do these or relocating them. It's to allow midwives and other non physicians to do the abortions. Is that right? And I, I think a major concern with that is when you are in a rural community, you're farther from medical facilities that are yeah. open 24 7, emergency facilities capable of handling uterine hemorrhage incomplete abortion, which mm. is a known common complication. Uh, so I, I think we, we probably should argue against expanding scope first for less trained people in these rural areas. It, it's kind of a scary thing, too. This is right, right before you go. The, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm not an expert on the whole. I mean, there, there's other organizations that focus a lot, like, like uh, Operation Rescue, on, on botched abortions mm -hmm. and women that have been really harmed by abortions. So, and that's just not my, my, my area of, of expertise. But I know a lot of times what they've found when these really bad things happen in abortion clinics where women are really, really severely harmed, they're really bad perforations, things like that. A lot of times these women are kind of rushed to an emergency room, mm -hmm. but they won't answer any questions. They won't say it was from an abortion and there's all the secrecy and so a lot of times like the complication rates that we hear a lot of times especially from maybe groups that are not ACOG are it's, it's way underreported because they're trying to hide that mm. bad things happen in abortion so imagine what's even what you know the bad things that could happen in these rural communities if they're not near an emergency room you know I don't what happens if something really really awful yeah. happens which it will mm. uh, that just seems scary to me John what do you 
Well, a- absolutely. And the thing that's amazing to me was I actually was comparing some of these statistics. And I think, Josh, the statistic was actually there's a few counties that don't have them. But, you know, even in our own valley, if you live in Madera County or Tulare County, there's no abortion clinics there. But you're within less than an hour from a abortion clinic. So that was the study. I think it's 1% of Californians live outside of, you know, a one-hour radius of an abortion clinic. But the very interesting thing was I was curious how that number compared with other types of medical care. And I actually found out that 3% of Californians live more than an hour from a level one trauma center. And it's very interesting to me. um, I'm curious, has anyone ever thought of introducing a bill to lower the definition of a level one trauma center (laughs) so that those counties that are more rural would be able to say they have a quote unquote level one trauma center? I'm I'm a, a very, very proud member of the American College of Surgeons, mm. which provides advanced trauma uh, life support certification, and that would not be an interest <laughs> of ours as physicians. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's pretty telling to think about my own experience in practice that in taking care of women diagnosed with breast cancer, mm. Um, there was about a 70-mile radius wow. of women I was referred because so few uh, physicians are available in remote rural areas. Hmm. Breast cancer is a lethal disease, particularly when it is not found early and treated in a timely fashion, especially among younger women. Hmm. And we know that in the minority communities that I served among the Hmong, among the, the Hispanics, that these are very, tend toward aggressive cancers and they tend to hit earlier. So mm. that's even more right. important that we increase access there. Um, that That is really kind of a strange juxtaposition. Mm. Right, okay, in 30 yeah. seconds or less, what can people do about this bill? What should people be doing if they want to speak up about this? Everyone who has a belief that there is something wrong with this bill, whether it's patient safety or another issue against abortion, for example, should contact their legislator and should contact all of the members of the Senate Health Committee, including Senator Kehoe. They should take a look and they can call my office to get the information of what bill this is, SB 1501. Take a look at the co-sponsors, the author, and let them know what you feel. Phone calls, faxes, personal visits, that makes sense. What doesn't make sense, though, is email, since we get thousands of them a day. Okay. And I would certainly encourage everyone who approaches this issue to approach it with a seriousness mm. and the rationality it deserves, because women's lives are at stake. Mm. Linda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. That's our show. Have a great week. For your information, California SB 1501 has been reclassified as SB 1338. Thank you. Life Report is produced by Right to Life of Central California. Visit their website at fresnoprolife.org.